welcome um, Russell Johnson, who is the Senior Associate Commissioner at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. But before I do, I would just like to share a brief uh, biography with you. Dr. Johnson started his career as both a teacher and an administrator. After graduating from DePaul University, Dr. Johnson served in the Jesuit Volunteer Corps as a language arts teacher in Phoenix, Arizona, and a special education instructor in Mobile, Alabama. He was then an elementary special education teacher in Newton, Massachusetts, and for five years before heading the elementary special education department for the Wellesley Public Schools. In 2004, Dr. Johnston earned his Doctorate of Philosophy and Educational Leadership from Boston College. In that same year, he became Administrator of Special Services for the West Springfield Public Schools, a role he held until becoming Superintendent in the same district in 2010. Dr. Johnson also led the West Springfield Public Schools from 2010 to 2014, and under his leadership, the district's four-year graduation rate increased from 71.7% to 81.6%. The annual dropout rate declined to 2.1%, and students across the grades made considerable performance gains. Dr. Johnson led West Springfield's work to increase the depth and rigor of the district's curriculum, to create a collaborative process between school committee members, administrators, and the local teachers union to promote student learning and to effectively implement the state's new educator evaluation system, to reach out and to engage families to address students' barriers to learning. Dr. Johnston also launched, launched a Pathways to Prosperity program at the high school to enhance students' college and career preparedness. And since August 2014, Dr. Johnston has served as the Senior Associate Commissioner at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education where he manages the state's accountability and assistance system for all public schools and districts to support their work to raise achievement for all students. Dr. Johnston oversees the implementation of various initiatives to assess effectiveness, monitor improvement, and identify appropriate intervention. Dr. Johnston joined the uh, Administrative Council consisting of all uh, central office administrators and principals this summer to begin the conversation with us. And he believes deeply in the mission in which we are all invested. And I, I welcome him here this morning. So with deep appreciation and no further ado, I now welcome Dr. Russell Johnston. Good morning. Uh, so I'm Russell Johnston. I uh, appreciate the uh, quick reminder of where I've been. Uh, but it's really important about where we're going. And it, so in addition to what uh, Sonia told you about what I uh, do with the department, uh, an important detail to add is that um, I oversee accountability assistance, special education, uh, data monitoring, things like that. Um, and through my work, uh, what called me to leave being at the district level to come to the department was a job that particularly focuses on the most marginalized and historically undereducated students in Massachusetts. Because though I firmly believe that we have made tremendous gains in this state, and I'm so proud and I'm going to show you some, I think, very interesting information about the, the progress that the state has made and how Falmouth has been a part of that, uh, I truly believe that there are kids that aren't getting the full education that they need, and I want to be a part of helping to create that change for them. So uh, it's, a, it's a decent sized responsibility. Uh, we, as you know, have, uh, through accountability, some work that we do uh, relative to turnaround uh, in places like Boston, in New Bedford, um, across the state. Uh, but we also have our receivership districts, uh, which we have three, uh, Holyoke, Lawrence, and Southbridge. And this summer, uh, or late this spring, uh, the, the receiver, who is essentially the superintendent for the district, uh, left, um, unfortunately. And so I am now uh, the superintendent for that district. Right here. Uh, so, I stand here with my cell phone, actually, I'm going to have to put it right here on the table because uh, um, today's day three of school. Uh, we had convocation last week. I welcomed our educators back in the auditorium, similar to this. I have to tell you, having to do work like that keeps you honest. So if I'm going to go work at the department and have these policies that affect kids and teachers, parents all across the state, I don't think it's such a bad thing that every once in a while you have to go back and really get in the weeds um, and be with the students, be with the faculty. And so I come to you today with, I think, a degree of humility, a degree of learning, uh, a constant sense of learning of how to get better. Uh, I know that just listening today, I thought, 
And next time I do convocation, I want to have my marching band come. <laughs> you know, up here on the stage, like I feel like I'm a pale comparison to, to the to color guard. So, I'm uh, really glad to launch into this with you. Uh, but, you know, first, as we uh, get in, I just want to tell you quickly about today's presentation. Uh, so, we're going to start with bumps. Uh, we're going to maybe surprise you being the guy from the state to begin by talking to you about wellness. Uh, and then, um, you did, unfortunately, maybe for you, I'm not sure, invite the data guy from the department, right? Like, you could have had the person who oversees dance, or one of the other muses, maybe a tragic comedy or a comedy. Who's our classics teacher? Here's the Latin teacher. Are you here? All right! Oh. That was my Latin joke. I took four years of Latin. I so appreciate it. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so, no, you have the data guy, so uh, this presentation is a little data heavy, but I promise to try to make it interesting and really apply what's happening in Massachusetts to Fallon. And then, you know, really the theme that you've been working on yesterday and today is to think about how has the student population been changing? Uh, the, the anxiety at times, the, the types of social emotional um, sort of issues that students are bringing into the classroom. How are you thinking about that? And today I'm going to focus a little bit more on race and poverty as well, and the demographics of our children, and how can we make sure that we are welcoming the whole child into our schools. And so um, just thinking about our changing student population and some ideas for continual improvement. Nothing new, nothing like I'm coming to you today to launch some great new ESE initiative, I promise. Uh, but really a way of just saying how can we refine our work and how can we learn together and grow together. So, uh, I threatened or promised uh, to begin uh, by talking about wellness. And, you know, when I go to work with any district in the Commonwealth, and I say, I'm Russell Johnston, I'm here from the state, I'm here to help, there's always a little bit of a sigh, a little bit of a, what's he really about? Uh, and, you know, I can't really go to any convocation of a, across anywhere in the state. Every year, I try to do one. Uh, I've had uh, here in Falmouth, I did Southwick Tallinn, I live in Melrose. I'm really hoping to get invited to Stoneham or Wakefield or someplace closer, but I'm always happy to go. And I really feel like uh, an important message that I want to bring to any convocation is really to begin the year by thinking about your own wellness. And I appreciate, sincerely appreciate the work that this district is doing, thinking about the social emotional learning for our students. But I really want to think about your own social emotional development and your own self protection, your self resilience as you begin the year. So three quick points that I want to bring to you today. If I get to be a little preachy, I'm sure you guys all have great ideas as well. I happen to have the mic, I'm sorry. Uh, but so three things that I want to say to you about wellness. And it first starts with your students. And so, you know, I've worked in special education a lot in the state, being the state director of special education. I will tell you that particularly our students who have emotional behavioral disorders or our students who have experienced trauma, at times, really call for a level of resiliency in us, and a way for us to kind of compartmentalize and not take it personal. And so there will be kids this year who, despite your best efforts, will reject you, because that's a survival skill. That's something they've learned to need to do in their lives. And I need you, in a sense, to not take it personal. You're probably not the core of the reason why this student is experiencing anger or depression, and so what I've learned in my life is a theory of just sort of rational detachment. I'm going to be connected, I'm going to be fully on every day I walk into a classroom. But when I leave, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to let it go. I'm going to let my issues in the classroom stay in the classroom. When I go home to my family, I'm going to find that joy, that love, and, and not let it churn in, in my stomach all night long so that I can come back the next day refreshed and strong. The second point that I want to make is about each other, and this is, I love talking about this, a complication when you're all in this room together, uh, because there's this really important aspect of our lives that sometimes we forget, and it's about gratitude. And it's about being grateful for each other. And uh, one of the things that I'm really trying to work on in Southbridge, uh, where you know, I'm the superintendent right now, is to make sure that we do a lot more work on shout outs to each other. We end every single meeting with, well, how are we grateful for each other? What have we done to support each other recently? And I would encourage you as you begin this year to think about how will you express gratitude to each other? How will you show gratitude? People who routinely and daily practice gratitude experience higher levels of feelings of enthusiasm, feelings of self-actualization, uh, of agency, and lower levels of depression. So really thinking about how can I focus on gratitude on a daily basis? 
And it kind of connects to my third point, which is just about beauty. Um, I try to find something every day that just makes me happy. And if I want it to be a small thing, and I want to make sure I cherish it. Because our lives are busy. My son started middle school today. I got a picture from my spouse when I got here. I've been walking off to middle school in Mullows. I'm so happy about that. Uh, but, you know, he's got, he's, we're going to probably have homework tonight. I won't be surprised. Uh, that's how Melrose is. We were doing it last night, finishing up that summer reading. We're going to probably start the new stuff tonight. Uh, so I'm going to be busy <laughs> when I get home tonight. And uh, so trying to find that one moment, something small, and just being grateful for that moment as well. I thought it was going to happen today coming over the bridge, because I love coming over the bridge. But, uh, but I don't know, it's not that lovely. And uh, there was a truck on the right side of me. And, uh, <laughs> so it, that wasn't my small moment today. But, uh, so, uh, still on the search for the small moments. So again, rational detachment, uh, gratitude, and beauty. Uh, maybe three things. If you think of nothing else that I tell you about today, I will be most pleased if you just happen to remember that as you begin this year. So now I'm just going to move to the boring part of the presentation. That's it. That's, that was the exciting part. Uh, we're going on now to, uh, to give you some of my, my shtick about, uh, again, Massachusetts in context and Falmouth within that. So. Um, important to remember that at the department, we've had five core strategies for many, many years now. Uh, this hasn't changed. Uh, we've added the heart in the middle, uh, the focus on social emotional learning. Again, why I'm so pleased to be here in Falmouth today, uh, because you're really going about this very deliberately. Uh, a lot of my work focuses on turning around the lowest performing schools and districts, and I'll just take you back up to the top where we have launched our new curriculum frameworks, which I hope you are finding useful, for sure. I'm very excited about the way in which they integrate a lot of the uh, learning standards uh, that had seemed sort of disparate in the past. So um, again, I won't remind you of those one at a time, but just to tell you that we're staying the course. And it is very sad for us in the department that Commissioner Chester passed away this summer. Uh, very a hard time for us, to be honest. And uh, we had his memorial service earlier this week. And what I intend to do is to make sure that we just stay strong in uh, the types of things that we've set out to do. And I want to tell you why. Um, Massachusetts and every single district in our Commonwealth, every LEA in our Commonwealth, has helped us lead the way, has helped us become, frankly, the envy of the nation. When I go to statewide uh, or nationwide uh, conferences and I meet with other state leaders from other states, they tell me that they think here in Massachusetts, working at our state education agency, that maybe I roll in about 10 a.m., <laughs> take a leisurely lunch, right? Because we have had such impressive results. And I can tell you, myself, my team at the agency, we're working hard every single day. We are so dogged and determined, especially to reach those kids that we just haven't quite gotten to yet. But nonetheless, we are definitely leading the nation. Very pleased about that. Here's the history lesson today. Uh, so to take us back to 1993, uh, this is for the history teachers. I hit the Latin teacher, not meaning the history teacher. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we instituted, um, you know, some changes actually here in Massachusetts that, some would theorize, have led to the uh, progress that we've seen for our children. And so things like more equitable funding, higher learning standards, higher quality student assessments, uh, more school choice, and accountability for results. Now I realize some of the things I tell people about working in the department is that there are a lot of opinions about the work that we do, a lot of opinions about, it's not just what we do, we implement the state laws, so this is stemming from law, uh, that I'm sure as you look at that, you probably have some positive reactions, you might have some negative reactions. Um, it's my job to continue to kind of push through and figure out how can we continue to refine our work, but this is what was in the changes that we made in 1993, and we really, uh, you know, some of what is said about Massachusetts is we've stayed the course with this. We've really kind of, you know, stayed on message with these important points. And as a result, uh, we are number one. And a lot of people don't know this. Uh, we actually asked, um, and we had some pro bono work from a marketing firm that actually reached out and kind of polled people in Massachusetts. And it was pretty striking how few people actually know the amazing results that we get here in Massachusetts. And so, you know, just some of the really important things that we're doing for our kids, that you are doing for our students, uh, each and every day, is truly impressive. Um, you know, thinking about the nation's report card. So this is the one way across the United States that we can determine, you know, how are the states doing in comparison to each other, and where are the signs of strength. <laughs> so, 
Um, and just, you know, I'm not going to go over these, but just to, you know, the, the uh, uh, orange line is the nation, the yellow line is Massachusetts. Just to give you a sense of the difference, I am so pleased to be the parent of a public school child here in Massachusetts. <laughs> Uh, changes are occurring, and so uh, math is just something you know to ask questions nationally and within our state. Uh, this one, uh, I don't create these slides. Uh, I'm like a spokesmodel for the agency. Like the uh, and so when uh, my team in delivery actually sent this over to me, uh, I thought it was like a random number generator. It took me a minute to kind of focus on it. So these are this is the results from the PISA exam. So this is a test that's given uh, randomly to schools in Massachusetts, so I'm not sure if Falmouth has been selected in the most recent administration, uh, but we do a representative sample of students from within Massachusetts. Then it's the, it, this test also happens to be given uh, across all of the, the nation, and uh, I think North Carolina does it individually from within their state as well. So it's done for all of the United States, and then individual states can opt in, and I'm pretty sure it's just Massachusetts and North Carolina. There might be another state. So uh, let's interpret that top line there. In reading, uh, of the 72 countries slash educational systems that participated in PISA, no one is higher. We're at, we're at the top of all the 72 countries or educational systems that participated. There's no one higher than us. In science, Singapore is higher. And in math, there are 11 educational systems that are higher, and you can see them listed there. Those are very impressive results, very, very impressive results. And again, what that says to me is that we, do, we need to not just be strong in, within our state, we need to know that we're preparing kids for a global economy. And again, I think we can point to this and see that we very much are. And um, Commissioner Chester really, this meant a lot to him, these types of data, not simply as a way of sort of patting ourselves on the back, but saying, what can we learn about this? So we spent time, for example, looking at these data, peering into how much time are kids spending in, on learning in other countries or other educational systems? And what does that mean to us about um, how we use time in our schools? So continuing to kind of push ahead. And what's interesting, I told you that, you know, this is a news to you, uh, the work that we do as a state agency is certainly controversial at times and ethically challenging, ethically needs to bring a real lens of consideration to what it means. And there was a story on WGBH about these results, and they said, it was a very cynical story, and they said the only reason we do this is, uh, in a sense, to try to promote our real estate values, uh, our chambers of commerce, that this is just done to kind of, it's almost like a tourism message. Uh, and I can tell you that it's very much not. Uh, we really want to know how we can, how we're doing, how we're stacking up, and how we can make ourselves better. So. Um, I hope I'm not boring you too much, uh, but as we look at our results nationally and internationally, we can see uh, great things. So as we are at the 25-year mark of the reform work that's been done in Massachusetts, you should be looking forward to hearing more about what we want to do as a celebration. I'm not sure how great we're going to be at uh, forming a celebration across the state, but I think we can do it. Uh, there'll be uh, some work that you should hear more about this year uh, about leading the nation. And hopefully you'll even see our billboard as you're driving down the streets, for example, uh, because we really want the word to get out. I can tell even talking to you today that maybe some of this information was new to you. Uh, and that sense of joy, that spontaneous joy that you had in seeing these results, I want them shared more broadly. I want everyone to feel like we've been a part of something very important for kids here. And again, when I talk to other state leaders, uh, they really want to know what it is that you're doing uh, that's that special recipe uh, for making things better for kids. So keep it up. Keep going. Really please. Ah, uh, but I'm not done with data yet. But I got to talk to you about how we stack up nationally and internationally. Just want to spend a few minutes talking to you about how we're doing just within our state. I promise to be quick. Uh, but so statewide assessments. Uh, I think it's important for you to know that we've been very stagnant in grade 3 math. So as much as we've made great progress in a lot of areas, there are some signs that do concern me a bit that I just want us all to be thinking about. And thinking about how can we continue to push through and, and not just uh, break our arms patting ourselves on the back. Because uh, while there's success, there's also challenge. And so these grade three reading results, uh, in both, well, mostly reading, where you can see it's basically unchanged uh, from 2003 to 2015, uh, that's a question. It's a concern. Um, 
And I always like to call out some of our, the populations that I'm most concerned about. And so um, our students with disabilities. Um, if you look back at 2001, a third of our students in grade, in grade three were proficient uh, or higher, proficient or advanced, uh, in ELA. And now it's a fifth in 2014, the last time we had a unified test from across the state. So I really ask myself about what is, what's happening here. And I don't have all the answers to this. I've certainly been going across the state showing these data, asking people to reflect on you know, are, how are we making a difference and how are we making sure that we reach some of our students who have historically been more challenging, more difficult to reach, such as our students with disabilities. So again, I just want you to think about that um, for your own work this year, about uh, how, how do we uh, know that we are truly being effective with uh, students with disabilities. Our grade four performance, again, the uh, orange line is ELA, and you know we're, we're preparing future readers, uh, future writers, and uh, struggling to, uh, to make a difference there. Uh, grade eight performance, uh, you can see uh, the change there, again, notable change. Uh, but as I call out students with disabilities, you can see the gap in grade eight math in particular uh, is very wide. And so we are very much as an agency trying to focus more on early grade literacy and middle grade math uh, and thinking about how do we provide integrated supports uh, so that we uh, can um, scaffold and provide all students with the supports that they need in our schools. Uh, grade 10 MCAS, uh, tremendous increase. We know uh, that we are really getting a lot more kids over the finish line uh, and we're very excited about this, these types of changes. Um, I love that when we look at data at the department, we always want to know not so much how are we doing in the aggregate, as this shows, but what's happening with the achievement gap. Where are we at narrowing that gap for our African American students and our Hispanic students in particular, uh, where the gap has been the widest. So you can see that it's been narrow, uh, but it still exists. It still persists. And so again, here's a challenge for us. And so you know, I think our journey is a journey of success. But it's also a journey of challenge. And how are we going to rise uh, to the challenge of fully closing that achievement gap as we go forward? And then, what's the difference between our low-income students and our non-low-income students? Again, if you think about back in 2002, if you were a low-income student in Massachusetts, you were likely, very highly likely, to be in that low needs improvement level. And so what does it mean now uh, for our, the, our students from poverty are mostly in the proficient range in 10th grade. It's fantastic, it's great news, but again, it's that gap that can, can, continues to, uh, to worry me a bit. My mouth is dry, so I better talk quick uh, about graduation rates. Uh, but this is tremendous work that has been done to keep our kids in school across the state. And again, you know, this is a lot of data, these are a lot of data all at once, but I hope that it just gives you that sense of the work you've been doing, you know, if you've been working in an elementary school or middle school, you've touched these kids uh, back in 2006, who now in 2016 are graduating, who historically maybe wouldn't have. And so just think about the many doors that you are opening for kids as a result of this tremendous work uh, that you've uh, put into motion. Uh, our uh, students with disabilities, again, great improvement, but it's really important to look at the difference in the percentage. So our four-year graduation rate is in red. So about 72% of our students with disabilities graduated uh, in 2016 compared to 87%. That's a big gap. That's something that's really worth paying attention to. Uh, so again, let's be excited about that change from 61 to 72, but be mindful of how much further we still want to get to. And one of the things that uh, I, I think about is that the great gains that we've seen um, have been um, sort of the low-hanging fruit. And now we really need to dig into the types of issues that are kind of more persistent and harder to, to get to, such as uh, changing these types of statistics. Um, the annual dropout rate, oh, thank you. Oh, you're awesome. <laughs> uh, I just have to stop to drink it, it's gonna be the problem. Again, I have the mic, I'm sorry. Uh, the dropout rate, again, uh, tremendous work. Uh, again, you see the difference between students with disabilities and all students. And uh, we use the annual dropout rate in our accountability system because this is a, a, a statistic you can change on an annual basis. Whereas if we only include the four-year rate, it means that it's really hard to show the year-to-year -year differences that you're making at the high school. So 
um, a quick plug for why. So, I told you I was going to uh, put this in context for Falcon. And so, uh, I decided that, you know, you know that our logo down there on the lower right hand side, uh, that's called Starman. Uh, so, anytime you're looking at one of our presentations, you see Starman there. And I thought, if I'm going to tell you about Falmouth data, if I'm going to show you Falmouth data, I need a Falmouth image. And so I started with your clipper. I thought I was going to call it a schooner, uh, but this morning I quickly locked that away at my clipper. <laughs> Not schooner. And uh, so I thought about using that, but really what we're here to do is to educate children. And so I wanted the image, anytime I talk about Falmouth data, which won't be too much in this presentation, but some. I wanted to use an image of kids. And so when I did Google, when I used Google Images and Google found the public schools, this was the image that I came up with. It was an article about a social emotional program, I think it's called uh, Caring Classroom maybe, uh, that's being used. I don't know. It was an image that came up, an article about great work being done here in Falmouth. Maybe this is from another community because no one's like, hey, I know her. Uh, but again, I think it symbolizes I think it's a better symbol of what you're setting out to do <laughs> than the clipper. So, uh, the graduation rate here in Belmont. And you know, uh, when I worked, I worked in West Springfield for a decade. It's a community that I love. I love being there. But you know, I didn't stop a lot to kind of take stock of the changes over those 10 years. And I, I wonder if you have, uh, it's just a guess, that maybe uh, I can show you some things today that are publicly available but not often looked at. So the story of Massachusetts, I think, is very much played out here in Falmouth, uh, that you have had this tremendous increase uh, in graduation rate. You know, all students from 84% to 87, uh, your students with disabilities from uh, set basically 61% to 70, um, and you've historically had, so keep in mind, this is like where I get really wonky, I'm sorry, but this is the stuff I love. Uh, we don't include uh, any subgroups unless you have six students. So in 2006, you didn't have in your four-year cohort of, gradu of graduates uh, six African-American students. In 2016, you did. I think it's just important to, uh, to think about that. Uh, you did have a uh, Hispanic subgroup, a very small Hispanic subgroup in 2006, a very small Hispanic subgroup in 2016. And uh, boy, I'm start juggling. Uh, and uh, so that's really the difference of one student. Uh, and so important to keep in mind uh, these changes and, and when you look at data, again, to interpret them carefully and cautiously. Uh, but again, great to see, uh, I think, for, for the work, again, that's been done across the state has very much played out. Um, but really, the message that I want to bring to you today is really about our children themselves and how they're changing across the state. Uh, and it's changing right before our eyes. And I love the recognition uh, for the educators who've been here for over 25 years. And many of you have either experienced this, if you're younger, you've been a, a student in our state, or if you've been an educator, you've seen the demographics changing. But in a place like Falmouth, it's been, it hasn't been a huge change, uh, but it, there has been a significant change. And so I wanna just tell you a little bit about that change in Massachusetts and what that's looked like. Uh, here in Falmouth, this might be for some of you what you already know, but maybe for some of you, I'm just helping to kind of set the year around kind of that history and where, where we've been and where we're going. Try to remember this for that one. So, uh, starting with uh, looking at the students themselves, uh, let's start with the red line. This is the one that uh, is very concerning to me. We have the second highest rate of identification of students with disabilities in the nation. Only Rhode Island is higher. And so you can see that we haven't changed this. This is basically unmoved. Every year I say to my team in special education planning policy, bring me the data. It's about that time of year, so I'm on Southbridge a lot. So pretty soon I'll say to them, bring me the data. Tell me what 2017 looked like. And I'm concerned that we will be basically unmoved. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that a little later in my presentation. Uh, but you know, the, it raises questions about who we're identifying them, if the rest of the nation is maybe more at 12, 13 um, percent. Do we have false positives in special education um, here in Massachusetts? It's something worth considering. But please note that I'm not putting a cap on this. I'm not going to come around and say we have to boot kids out of special education. But we very much want to ask the question about do we have, uh, are we identifying the, the right students? I think the 
uh, green line there is very interesting. So uh, I just want to explain the staggered difference. Uh, from 2007 to 2014, you see that uh, our measure was called low income. And then the yellow line uh, from 2015 and 2016 is economically disadvantaged. Probably a lot of you, but maybe not all of you, know that we changed the metric uh, from low income to economically disadvantaged. We like to make things difficult for ourselves. <laughs> so we were like, ah, oh, you know, no, no. There was a reason for it. We needed to align more of our identification with the identification that other state agencies use so that we're using a common metric across um, all of our state agencies. Uh, so low income was based on free and reduced lunch, and uh, economically disadvantaged is based on families who are receiving other services uh, from fe uh, federal or state services. Um, and so uh, you can see that there was a difference that occurred when we switched metrics. But nonetheless, there's very much a story here of our children in Massachusetts experiencing poverty at a much higher rate now than they were 10 years ago. Um, and then you can also see this change in our English learners, um, going from 5.6% to 9% of our students in Massachusetts. So these are the kids that we get to serve here, and it's an opportunity to serve. And I firmly believe that we need to see this as a strength, that we need to see our changing population as an opportunity, not as a deficit. And, but it's going to take work uh, for us to do that and to do it well. So I wanted to take you inside Falmouth. I made these slides. You can tell they're not quite as fancy uh, as what other people in my agency know how to do. Uh, so taking you back to uh, 2014, uh, oh, I think I have something wrong. 87% of the kids weren't free to lunch in Massachusetts uh, in 2014. I think it's I think it's a comparable. Oh, we know that though actually from this slide. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so. Um, Free and reduced lunch in school year 14, that should be the 40%, the 38%, I'm sorry, on the right side. Uh, you were at 28%. When we switched to economically disadvantaged, uh, maybe what I'd like you to do is look at 15, 16, and 17 for Falmouth, uh, that we see a change. We see uh, the numbers sort of ticking up in terms of the children who are experiencing poverty uh, here in Falmouth. And um, just important to note, important to be thinking about how are we reaching an increasingly number of children who are experiencing poverty? And what does that mean in their lives? And what does that mean as they enter our classrooms? I also want to talk to you about race and the race of the children uh, we have the opportunity to educate here in Massachusetts. So the green line, green line is our white students. Uh, yellow is Hispanic. Red is African American. And blue is Asian, for those of you in the back. Uh, and so you can see that the uh, our students of color are actually very much increasing in Massachusetts. And uh, when I think about this, I think about um, statistically, 80% of the educators in the nation are white. And as we see our ch students changing, how do we understand their experiences? How do I, as a white person, as a white male, transcend myself and see that there's a world that's much bigger than me and experiences that are much bigger than my own and that are very much of value? And then when I work with students across the state, I want to make sure that I bring their entire culture, their entire identity into our schools. And so I think that you know, that's a challenge for all of us, uh, something that we all need to continue to get better at. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that, but again, important to see those changes. And most importantly for you today, because that's like all nice, fine and dandy about the state, what does it mean here in Falmouth? I am confident on these numbers. I apologize on my mistake on the last slide. Uh, but take a look, uh, start with uh, looking at your white students uh, as, a, as a subgroup. Uh, in 2006, they were about 89% of the population. Today, they're about 82%. And then as you look across the other subgroups, you can see that there isn't maybe one huge change, uh, but it's, it's an increase across the board. And so, you know, again, thinking about what are we doing, uh, what's, what is this mean, right? It's not any one group that's changed dramatically. But it's all of them. And it's going to continue to change. And so how do we rise to that? How do we figure that out for ourselves? And make sure, again, that we are um, making our classrooms that place where kids can actually learn from each other in a very valued and respectful way. I love this slide. Do you love this one? <laughs> this is great. So as we think about the kids that we educate, particularly kids from poverty, um, there are, uh, anywhere we look in this state, where we have a difference in, okay, each dot, sorry, let me back up on this one. Each dot is a school. So your schools are in here. 
And on the x-axis, uh, we have uh, the percentage of students in each school who are economically disadvantaged. So starting from 0% economically disadvantaged to 80% economically disadvantaged from point of the school. And then on the uh, vertical axis, we have their proficiency in English language arts for grades three to eight. And what we're looking at here is, see how the N is 957 schools? That's 957 schools in the state, so we have about 1,800 in the state. 957 have both subgroups, economically disadvantaged and non-economically disadvantaged. And what this slide is showing to us is that in any school that exists in the state, there's a diff there is an achievement gap within the school itself between the children who are economically disadvantaged and those who aren't. And so as I think about your schools, uh, where you have a range, uh, your schools um, very much represent kids who are economically disadvantaged and students who are not. Right within our schools, we know that we still have a challenge. We need to reach those kids uh, in maybe ways that we haven't been quite successful at just yet. And so I'm going to move beyond this slide, but the concept is what I want you to say with you is that this challenge is everywhere in the state. It's something that we all uh, need to pay attention to uh, because I like the saying, all means all. But I actually prefer to say all means each. Um, and it's a saying that I heard earlier this summer um, that we really want to make sure we're reaching each of our students in a unique way. And the, the kids who are represented here as being a part of an achievement gap are the ones that we need to reach maybe in a more unique way uh, than we've been uh, historically able to do so far. All right, I'm going to move past this kind of quickly. Our uh, discipline, though, is very important. It actually brings out uh, a lot of strong feelings from me, actually. Um, pay attention to the blue line, that's the state. Um, and you can see that uh, back in 2014 when Chapter 222 came into being, there was this dramatic decrease uh, in the number of kids who were being suspended. So discipline means in or out of school suspension. And so you can see there was this dramatic decrease uh, in our students who were suspended, but it's plateaued a bit. And so it's raising some questions of how do we go a little deeper and a little further uh, to make sure that we can uh, continue to de decrease uh, the number of students who are disciplined. Um, but what's more important, and this is, well, I said I'd go fast through this, but I'm not going to, sorry. I just want to point out, this is really important to me. This is what actually really gets me uh, pretty fired up. So let's look at all students. Uh, this is 2015-16. 4% uh, of our kids experience discipline uh, in this state, if you look at all students. Let's look at students with disabilities. Almost double, right? It's not legal to suspend students for their disability. But I kind of feel like when kids get IEPs, we might need to tell them, we've just increased the likelihood that you're going to get suspended by double. And what is that? What's going on there? Equally importantly, let's look at our students who are African American or black, 9.3%. Our Hispanic and Latino students, our male students, so when I think about a student with a disability who's male and African American or Latino, I see a risk factor. I see something that we very much need to pay, pay attention to. And I feel like if we don't look at these data, we have blinders on. Because we think that what we're doing is that it's just one kid. It's just one kid in my class, maybe here in Falmouth, where you know, you've got that one kid who's going to experience suspension. But it's adding up. And we know that kids who are suspended are much more, much less likely uh, to graduate. And so we're setting them on a course. We begin with a suspension. Um, I know that before Chapter 222, when I was superintendent West Springfield, you could give kids like 30 day suspensions, 20 day suspensions. How could they ever get caught up? I mean, what were we doing? I mean, a lot of the things I've done in my past, I look at now and I'm like, what, what was that? What were we even thinking? And who were those kids? How often was it an African American student or an Hispanic student? How often was it a student with a disability? And what does it mean about where are our own biases in that. Um, you know, I've uh, heard this story, and I apologize to the administrative group who heard me say this earlier this summer, but of an educator who actually stepped back and looked at her class and saw that um, she was routinely sending two African-American boys to the office. And it was beginning that road that led to this for those boys. And what she stepped back and realized was that everybody in her class, not everybody, but a lot of the students in her class were off task. But it was those two boys who were actually particularly loud that made her target them 
So she sent them to the office, and the kids who were quieter, but also whiter, were not being sent to the office. And she realized what she needed to do was to work on better engagement student practices for all of her students, and at, in doing so, reduce the risk uh, that she's placing on an African American student. And she had to look at that bias that she had, that what did it mean that she saw those noisy African American boys as being the ones that she was sending to the office? And how did she take off those blinders and see that it was really about a bigger student engagement issue that she needed to address within her classroom? And if we don't take time to stop and ask those questions, I feel like we rush along and we keep replicating these types of data. So let's look at Falcon. Uh, all students, this is from 2016, uh, the last year that we have data reported on publicly. Uh, so all students, 5%. Economically disadvantaged, 9%. Students with disabilities, you know what, I'm not here to cast blame. I'm saying we're all part of the same system. I'm telling you about things I did in my past, where I suspended kids for lengthy periods of time. But 11% of kids with disabilities being suspended raises a question. And I hope that as you're doing this work around social emotional learning and looking at how we can support kids better, that you, know, you can pay attention to this and be thinking about it. Very much the same way with African American and black students and Hispanic students, just thinking about where is, is it possible, and I, this, is a rhetorical, this is a rhetorical question, how is it possible where bias is factoring into this? Bias about disability, bias about race, is something that we just need to attend to. And I'm saying this message everywhere I go. Um, so finally, chronic absenteeism, uh, we can see that that's been fairly well stuck. Um, here in Falmouth, uh, you are a little higher than the state average. So uh, does anybody know what your, this is like my pop quiz for today. Uh, what's your chronic absenteeism rate? What's your percentage? What would you guess? I'm hearing 20, 30, uh, it's actually 15, it's not that bad. Uh, but 15% of your students being chronically absent, absent um, is certainly a question. And the reason why I want to like go on and on and on about all these data is maybe just for you to take a step back and kind of look at these trends and think about them. And think about kids who are either being disciplined and are therefore out of school, and students who are chronically absent and are out of school. We know that we need them here. And so I applaud, I know you've been doing work to address this, uh, and I think it's going to work. Uh, and I look forward to watching these data continue to improve, particularly related to attendance. So that's it, that's my data piece. You can all relax now, done with the data. Uh, summary, we're leading the nation in so many ways, so proud of the work that we've done. Falmouth has been very much a part of that change, so thank you. But our student demographics are changing, and we need to see that as an opportunity. And we really need to ask ourselves, how can we reach our students in ways that we just don't have the tools for yet, but we will gain those tools, and we'll work together to find our way to them. And I think the work that you're doing with McLean is one great example. I don't know any other district that's doing what you're doing. And I think that's, uh, I think that's phenomenal uh, to be thinking about uh, how do we reach these kids who we are privileged uh, to serve. So uh, I'm out of data, but I'm not out of message. So uh, <laughs> settle in. Uh, I oversee a center called District Support, and I've told you about what, uh, what's in that center. Um, I've realized that if the state education agency isn't talking about these things, and if we're not kind of putting out their information like I've shared with you about where we have strength, but also where we have challenges, we are not going to create the right type of dialogue. We're gonna allow those blinders to stay on for all of us. So my team, this is a little wordy, but we created a, a statement of core values. We had to say, what do we believe in? And it's really about equity and excellence. It's about valuing families as uh, partners in the educational uh, support of their children. Um, that we want to make sure that our educators are culturally proficient and honor and leverage diversity. And then finally, that we really have to work to uh, reduce and eliminate implicit bias, racism, and promoting social justice. Now, I presented this last year, last fall, to the Urban Superintendent Network, Superintendents. And uh, they looked at that last one, and one of them raised her hand and said, you know what, you are ESE. Uh, what are you going to do, create a form? Like, how are you going to do this? Uh, I don't have all the answers, but I know that the work is ongoing and has to be addressed. So, uh, you know, to take us inside, my, the next part of my presentation, I want to go a little bit deeper into a conversation about race and about poverty. And to think about, as I have these core values, 
What do they actually mean to me, and how are we trying to play them out? And so I'm going to take you uh, inside our work in Southbridge. Um, so Southbridge is the lowest performing district in Massachusetts at this time, uh, and we are going to change that. Uh, and uh, I'm very pleased with the work that we are trying to do. But a lot of it is trying to uncover what hasn't worked in the past. And what I'm going to show you next is trouble. Um, it's actually really hard to read, and so brace yourselves. I'm not kidding. Uh, this is this is difficult. Uh, we commissioned a report last year uh, from EDC, the Education Development Center, uh, to find out more about the supports that are being provided to students with disabilities. And in um, Southbridge, we have about 20% of our kids are English learners. Of that 20%, half, half are identified for special education. So 20% of kids are English learners. When we look at those kids, we see disability. We see half of them have a disability. Remember, the statewide average is 17%. So is it possible that really that many kids who are English learners are disabled? We wanted to find out why. Why do people think that? Here comes the hard part. So in this report, we have a lot of Puerto Rican families in Southbridge. And the report read, we were even told by one educator that the root cause of the behavior and academic issues in students was because all the Puerto Rican families end up living together because they cannot afford their own housing. And they end up in green. Now, we all gasp at that. It's horrifying. And in, particularly in this day and age, with what's happened in Charlottesville, we have to figure out how do we think about something like this? How do we respond to something like this? And the point that the author was making is that, yes, those words are unique and disturbing, but there was a theme of blame. Now, when I read this, I represent Southbridge right now. And I really believe in our families. I believe in our educators. Again, I told you the work we do is ethically challenging. This is definitely at the core of that. And there are people who said that statement wasn't made. No one ever said that. And there are people who said, I've actually experienced that. This has been part of my reality here, of a feeling if I'm a Puerto Rican family here, if I'm a Puerto Rican parent, that I feel some blame cast towards me. And so it's been very eye-opening to have to have this conversation. It was like ripping off the Band-Aid, obviously, when this came out, uh, and very powerful. But why am I telling you this, right? Southbridge is far away from here. It's in Central Mass. You might not even know where it is, south of Worcester. Why am I telling you this? Why do I read this statement out loud? Because we can all kind of look over there and say, that's a problem in Southbridge. But you know what? How is, how is that maybe also something that we experience here in Falmouth? Or is there any element of this where we say, you know what, if the child just had a different family, everything would be okay for that kid? Instead of, how can we truly reach that family? What are we gonna do to get through? Uh, and where are we, how do we even, maybe subconsciously, have a belief of blame at times uh, towards our families. And so this is difficult to read, difficult to see, but for me what it does is it reminds me that this is not something unique to Southridge, this is something that by, by degree, that we are all a part of a society that has bias, uh, that is experiencing this, and particularly as we think about these national events that are happening, my challenge for you here at Falmouth is, how are you going to engage in a civil discourse about race, about poverty, in ways that will elevate ourselves, that will get past horrifying language like this, and make ourselves better? We can't change what's happening nationally. We can change what happens here in Falmouth. We can change what's happening for our kids. So I love this quote from James Baldwin. Nothing that is faced can be, nothing that is, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. So how are we going to face the challenges of the students who you are serving this year and help all of us rise up and speak truth to this? So when I told you that we're trying to lead this work at the department, as we think about our work in, in race, uh, so I oversee accountability for the state. And our accountability structure impacts children of color much more than children who are white. And so when I came to the agency, I was very surprised that for the first year I was there, we had very few conversations about race. And yet all of our policies have a very racial impact. And so one of the things that I try to do with my staff that I've been working on is, how do we actually have a protocol or a way of talking about race? And so as I think about your work this year, um, I don't 
you know, whatever, you, however you approach this, my encouragement to you would be to think about how are you going to structure and have a way of entering into a civil dialogue about race? Because as a white man, I will tell you, it's very easy for me to be silent around this. I have grown accustomed to not wanting to talk about race. And yet, it's so important. You saw how your demographics are changing. So how are you going to do it? And uh, so what we've done is we've worked on an actual protocol uh, that we use all the time in our work. And um, uh, using uh, one methodology, and there are others, but I would encourage you to continue to seek this out for what will work for you. Uh, but the idea behind this is that, uh, for instance, when I was showing you those data, or I was showing you uh, that horrible uh, passage uh, from the report from Southridge, uh, a lot of you may have been in the feeling quadrant about this. The data may have had you in the thinking quadrant. But as I'm engaging in a conversation about race with someone else, I need to be listening for where are they and thinking about where am I? Um, am I talking to someone who wants to intellectualize race? Or am I talking to someone who is having deep personal feelings about their experience of race? And so for us, we're always trying to find our way to the center of the compass. If you're talking to me and my members of my team, we're trying to figure out and listen for uh, how can we engage in that successfully. Uh, we also uh, have some other um, uh, ways of engaging the conversation. And what's been helpful for me are some things like speaking my truth. That uh, you don't hear me talking about white people over there, you will hear me talking about myself as a white man. Uh, because it's so easy to talk about other, and it's more important that I talk about I, and what's been my experience, and how do I use that to enter into a conversation and listen for other people's truths. Two other things that have been helpful for me as we talk about race is to expect to experience discomfort. I think my slide earlier probably made me very uncomfortable. And so instead of like shying away from that, I am a middle child. I'm really good at being a peacemaker. <laughs> I've chosen now to lean into it, to feel it, to be a part of it, and not to think that just because we're getting a little uncomfortable that I need to silence the conversation. And the other thing is that the final part is just to make sure that I accept that we're not going to put closure on anything. Again, I kind of want to wrap everything up with a bow. And there have been things that we've done at the department where we step back and we look at the racial element to it, and I see that it's not, I can't quite close it up with a bow. It's not. So you have to keep coming back to it and keep working at it. So why I'm telling you this is that I hope that as you're thinking about your students here, that whatever you do, you think about how do we, how are we going to talk about race this year in a way that will be civil, in a way that will be effective, and that we won't shy away from that conversation, that we'll lean into it, that we'll be okay with some discomfort, and that we'll accept that we can't close it all up, but we're going to stay committed to having that conversation. So. Uh, again, just some thoughts that I have about uh, how you can maybe more effectively engage in a dialogue with others. I want to move now to, to poverty. Um, this is the final part of my presentation. You've been very patient. You've been a great audience. Uh, and so I do promise I'm uh, wrapping up now, ish, uh, with uh, the, final, the final half of my presentation. Uh, so uh, some years ago, uh, when actually when Commissioner Chester became our commissioner in 2008, he looked at that statistic that we have the second highest rate of identification of students with disabilities in the nation. And he said, why? He said, let's get to the bottom of that. So he commissioned a series of studies uh, from a professor at Harvard by the name of Tom Hare. And asked Tom, help me understand, one of the questions was, help me understand why we have this very high rate of identification. And the theory at the time going into it was that Massachusetts has always offered very, um, a high level of service for children with disabilities. Some of you might remember, it used to be called maximum feasible benefit. So we offered, you know, kind of sky's the limit in terms of what we could offer for children with disabilities. I see some smiling faces and nodding heads. Uh, and so the idea was that pushy parents are trying to get their kids into special education because they get something out of it. When Tom did his research, what was actually really interesting is that that wasn't it. It was that we are over-identifying children from poverty. And so let me take you a little bit inside those data. Um, uh, let me come back to that one. Um, so in Massachusetts, uh, I told you before, about 40% of our kids are living in poverty. Let's look, look at that by region in terms of number. Actually, oh, by percentage, actually. I like this. So here where you are, back in 2014 when we were still using low income, 
34% of the kids in this part of the state uh, were low income. Uh, and let's look at that change from 2010 to 2014. An increase of 20% during that time period. An additional 14,000 students is what we're talking about for your part of the state. Now let's go inside that a little bit further. So remember, hold in your head, 40% of kids in the state are identified as students with disabilities. So how many of those kids are being identified as having a disability? So here are our K students in grades K to 12, half. So if it's 17% of all students, but half of the children with disabilities, it says something about when we see, dis when we see poverty, we are often seeing disability. And the interesting thing about this is that this is not a statistic that plays out nationally. This is a Massachusetts phenomenon. and something that we need to figure out how are we going to uh, bring this to the ground. So uh, thinking about that once kids are identified, a lot of those children from poverty are being educated in substantially separate settings. So uh, in our substantially separate settings, 67% of our kids are low income. And 61% uh, of those students are also African American or Latino uh, from within that low income population. So again, that risk ratio of a student with a disability who's African American or Latino, we talked about the high rate of suspension, and then we're also much more likely to educate uh, those children in a substantially separate setting. Why is that a problem? Well, they're not as likely to graduate. If you are included, if you're in an inclusive setting, you're about five times more likely uh, to graduate high school on time. So although I try not to you know, I embrace the spectrum of services uh, for children with disabilities, I know that we have to continue to push on getting more of our children uh, fully included. So um, we have introduced a, uh, a new, uh, you know, I know there's a bad word, uh, we've introduced a, a project, though, to address this at the department. It's called uh, the, um, it used to be called the Low Income Education Access Project, and now we have called it, we changed the name uh, to Leading Educational Access Project. I had to go back to rerun myself. So, LEAP <laughs> is the name of the project. And uh, really what we're trying to do, it's a bit of a bold um, agenda that we have, is to try to help educators understand the impact of poverty on learning. And that there are very specific techniques that can be used to reach children from poverty. And I'm not gonna go on and on about what those are today. I know that it's something that your administrative team, uh, when I presented to them this summer, they're very interested in. And instead of, you know, my, my challenge with this is not to make this an additional initiative, but to actually embed it. How can we embed ideas about engagement, about supports for students, about expectations and rigor that reach our students from poverty um, as part of what we naturally do and not an additional thing that we do. So we have an online tool um, that we, is readily available if you're interested to look it up, where you can get answers to questions like this about just understanding the impact of poverty on learning, but then also what to do about it. And so if you go to our website, which has changed, uh, and you look for the LEAP project, you can learn more about that impact of poverty on learning and what to do about it. But as it relates to the work that you've been doing yesterday and now going forward in the year, the maybe most important message that I want to leave you with as you think about children from poverty and as it relates to the work that you're doing on social emotional learning is about emotions and about which emotions are learned and which are hardwired. And so as you look at this list, uh, this is a list of a fairly comprehensive list of emotions. Uh, some are hardwired and some are learned. And as educators, what I think is really powerful is that you figure out, well, what's in my control? And so let's take a look at what's in your control to teach versus what do our children come to school with hardwired. So the ones that I just highlight, or highlighted, highlighted, uh, are the ones that we're born with. Uh, anger, fear, joy, sadness, surprise, and disgust. And it's just good to know that's something that, that is just part of who we all are. Uh, but look at how many we have control over. Look at how many we can actually teach. And this gives me hope, because we know that children who've experienced trauma might be lacking in some of these skills. And you know, you might be a math teacher, you might be an English teacher, you might be a third grade teacher, and you think, why do I have to teach this? Well, we're not going to be successful at teaching the academics unless we spend some time attending 
to what we can be successful with. And so I just encourage you to continue to lean into the work that you're doing around social emotional supports for ch children and to think about how are you building in that time uh, to teach these skills so that you aren't as frustrated when you experience them. You know, when you think about the percentage, the very high percentage of your children living in poverty, making sure that you figure out, well, I actually have some tools that I can use to reach them. And maybe they're not the tools, maybe I didn't have those tools 10 years ago because poverty wasn't as much of an issue 10 years ago. But if I don't have them now, I'm gonna seek them out. And if I do have them now, I'm gonna use them because I know that's how I can be effective at getting through to all of my students. So a couple other um, important things or one other very important thing, maybe if I give you one important thing uh, to be thinking about, is just the relationship building that you can do with your students. And this crosses both the cultural proficiency aspect of our work as well as trauma sensitive and uh, poverty sensitive type of work is really just developing that deep relationship. And so as you begin the year, um, I'm encouraged by the work that will be done, for example, at the high school this year, through your mentorship program, to really dig in and find out more about what your children, what the experience of your children has been, because it's not going to be just one thing. And we can reach kids better when we actually have a way of, of tapping into who they truly are and making them feel welcome on a daily basis. And I know that's so simple. I know very often you think that you're doing that. Uh, but I can tell you that as an educator, when I was a teacher, sometimes I was just really busy. And kids were walking into the classroom in the morning, and I didn't stop to greet them by name and to welcome them and say hello. And I'll tell you that as uh, now somebody who provides a lot of professional development, I make sure I get myself ready ahead of time so I can do what Sonia did today, stand in the hallway and greet people, shake their hand. I know I feel better. I feel more welcome. Think about how our kids feel. Think about particularly a child from trauma, a child from poverty, who really needs that extra um, welcoming that extra relationship building each and every day. It's not done once, it's done every single day that you're building it up. I'm gonna get off my soapbox. But uh, I think you get the impression of, uh, of what I think is really important for our work. Uh, we have many um, districts and schools across the state who are involved in this work. So they're doing things like a book study, and I think you all have this plan um, across the district maybe uh, to be reaching um, in each and every school to be looking at the book Teaching with Poverty in Mind. Um, and it won't immediately involve every single educator in the district, but hopefully getting the concepts across to every educator. So things like a book study, seeking out professional development. Uh, we have um, some districts uh, pushing more funding towards uh, these types of concepts. Um, if you're curious to know, in a part of the challenge for us in Massachusetts, where we have over 400 districts, is that we kind of end up living in a silo. And so if you're curious about how we can bridge and find out uh, what else is happening relative to this work, or where there are some uh, exciting things happening in other districts, uh, just reach out. Uh, I'm here today, I have a connection to you now, I hope that you will ask, and I hope we can deliver on helping you see beyond your boundaries uh, to see where other great work is being done and be inspired. So, appreciate your, uh, your thinking about this. Again, um, I've just given you a snapshot. These slides have been taken directly from that online tool that we have, if you're curious about this. Something you can do on your own, it's something you can do as a team, but again, leaving you with an idea of how you can explore this idea further of the impact of teaching uh, with poverty in mind. So with that said, um, really my conclusion is uh, to be thinking about how collectively we can get this work done. Uh, that certainly there are uh, changes afoot um, from within the national landscape that challenge us, uh, that I'm sure will be lived out in our classrooms this year. Challenges in the way of the way in which our students are changing, but we need to see that as opportunity. Uh, an opportunity to really how the world is coming to our doorsteps, and that we need to like embrace that and really push it ahead uh, to be something more than who we've been in, in, in the past. Uh, so I'm excited about that opportunity, excited about what you're going to bring to students this year. So thank you for your time and attention this morning, and I hope this quote stays with you as you begin this school year. Thanks very much.